You have reached the Geek Elite. Good luck. Nostalgia is one of the strongest forces in the human psyche and is responsible for the continued existence of some of our favorite fandoms. From the minds behind the Dolphin Dreams podcast and Isolation Cast Voices from Quarantine, Saturday Morning Confidential takes you on a deep dive into the properties that helped influence the artists and creators of today. So whether you are a Goonie, a Gym Girl, a Digi Destined, or you just want to return to Oz... New episodes release on Fridays bi-weekly starting January 1st of 2021. And join us on the Wednesdays after the main show for the Serial Killer Radio Hour, where we sit down with the people responsible for the toys, shows, and fandoms that you love. Now you can find Saturday Morning Confidential at certainpov.com backslash smcpod or on your favorite podcast platforms. So don't forget to tune in for another deep dive into the files of Saturday Morning Confidential. Welcome back to another episode of VHS Gems, the podcast in which we open up the treasure box of old VHS movies, and I'm going to steal John's line from last week because I liked it so much, and see whether or not they are worthy of being redone in 4K, or whether or not they're just Target bargain bin (laughs) purchased for like three bucks, or not purchased at all. Um, I am Jessica, and joining with me is John. Hello, and welcome back also. Oh, yeah, I would like to thank Elizabeth so much for filling in for me. I had kind of a family emergency, and I think she did a wonderful job filling in for me. I absolutely (laughs) adored her what animal, what dog are the characters for When Harry Met Sally. Which I'm kind of jealous because I absolutely love When Harry Met Sally. And I do have an addition for that. Um, you guys were like wondering if there should be a modern version of it. And there kind of already is. Um, I would consider he's just not that into you to be the modern version of When Harry Met Sally. Mm. I don't know if you've watched it, John. But <laughs> um, maybe the first time it came out, it was probably one of those forgettable movies for me. I <gasps> absolutely love that one, too. <laughs> <laughs> But um, but I like um who is it uh, Justin Long so at the time I had a major crush on him so yeah he's he, cool. he was like one of the lead love interests so it was good but it has the same style where it's like that witty sort of humor about the differences between men and human uh, men and humans men and women <laughs> <laughs> and um and it also has like those sort of like documentary like sets where it's just like an older couple talking about their relationship like you see in When Harry Met Sally. Like those little confessionals? Yeah, like those little confessionals. Those little straight to the camera moments. Like Mm. reality TV kind of thing. I'm going to have to revisit it. I could have been in a bad place at the time. I didn't appreciate it fully. (laughs) I, I like it. It's one of my favorites just for the message of it in general and the it's just a good it's just a good rom-com i think when harry met sally is probably a little bit better because i think when harry met sally does a better job of actually being for everybody whereas he's just not that into you is very much kind of more of a chick flick based kind yeah. of it w- i think it was during that time when there was just a lot of chick flicks coming out like yeah. how to lose a guy in 10 days failure to launch all these different ones yeah it just probably got just lost in the jumble yeah, probably. But no, I, I, yeah, highly recommend it. That and Pride and Prejudice, the five hour one that BBC did. Oh, geez. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I own it too. So you can borrow it anytime. That's like the <laughs> female equivalent of the uh, Lord of the Rings extended edition. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Alrighty. Although a lot of females like Lord of the Rings extended edition too. So, <laughs> but yeah. still. Oh, I guess. Um, 
We are not talking about a rom com today, <laughs> though. We are talking about very much the opposite. Um, this is my second John Carpenter film. I was very let down, but we are talking about <laughs> <laughs> In the Mouth of Madness. I, I don't disagree with you. Side note, I think season three is going to be all about rom-coms. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but okay. Which should. We'll throw in a horror here and there, though. But <laughs> um, So this is my second John Carpenter film because you... You're welcome. I know, right? You, like, I don't know, six months ago, had me watch The Thing, which was utterly amazing. Um, This one, which I think I read was considered, like, John Carpenter said it was, like, the third part of his Apocalypse trilogy, which started with The Thing, and then it was Prince of Darkness, and then In the Mouth of Madness, and... To me, this is so different from The Thing. I don't know how you consider it a third piece of an apocalypse <laughs> Well, it, it's the, the whole idea, because they're not literally a trilogy, uh, because there's nothing that overlaps in them. Um, mm-hmm. Stylistically, plot-wise, everything is completely different. Um, what it is, is that each one has a premise that eventually leads to the end of the world which is why each one is a part of an apocalypse trilogy, but they don't actually, yeah, they they don't go together. It's, you know, it's, um, it's like saying, you know, um, the matrix starship troopers and Johnny mnemonic are all part of the cyberpunk. It's not even a good example, but you know, it's like, yeah, that's it's a horrible like, example, but I get where you're going. Yeah, at. Um, I mean, they have some slight overlap with actors that go in them, and of course, the director being the one that also like wrote and produced and all the that with them. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, John Carpenter, just kind of right off the bat, is an interesting filmmaker because he started off very indie, doing very like grindhouse uh, horror and sci-fi. I believe his movie Dark Star was kind of what's inspired the movie Alien. Um, mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, there's there's a little bit of an overlap with that movie and um, Jodorowsky's Dune as well, I believe. Um, I think God, you just got to throw in I, Jodorowsky's I do. Dune like every other um, podcast. Um, 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 it's, it's like a roofie. <laughs> I'm going to slip it in. So. Uh, <laughs> guy's... <laughs> <sighs> Things that will come back to haunt me someday. Anyway, um... <laughs> So, (laughs) yeah, so Carpenter was just one of those people who started off very, like, because he was sort of a underground, like, misfit, he gained a Mm -hmm. huge following early on, and that gave him a lot of clout. Mm -hmm. But then, towards the end of the 80s, that really started to kind of dwindle, and then in the 90s, I believe this is his last good movie. I still think it's good. Okay. But they go down steeply from here. Oy. Okay. I mean, I will note, like, I don't hate it, but I am... So I like horror, but I'm very picky on it. Like, I don't necessarily find horror scary. And, like, The Thing was scary to me because of the paranoia aspect of it and just, like, the build-up to everything. And this one just didn't have great build-up. And... It was funny to me as opposed to scary and kind of boring, especially compared <laughs> to the thing. But that's just yeah. I'm I'm really picky with horror. Like <laughs> the puppetry yeah. wasn't even as good. I don't know if it was the same person that did the thing. I can't remember the guy who did all the puppets for the thing. Rob but. Botine. No, actually, I think it was ILM that did the puppetry uh, in this one. Hmm. And some of the optical effects. Um, so I guess kind of, yeah, kind of running down, uh, if we were to consider, um, you know, Carpenter is one of those directors who does his best work when he's constrained by budget and uh-huh. locality. 
Because okay. what I consider, like some of his most effective movies, let's take for instance Halloween, that takes place in a little small town suburb. There's no major set pieces. It's just the looming threat of Michael Myers, who's like this unstoppable killing machine that's just continuously coming after you. One of the most yeah. suspenseful scenes in the whole movie is Laurie Strode literally just hiding in the closet, you know, trying to see through the little slits in the okay the the thing, you know, and um, the thing much bigger, more ambitious, but still all takes place in like a tiny little Antarctic setting. You know, mm-hmm. there's there's no background to speak of except stark white from the snow and the interior, which are basically sets. Um, yeah. The Prince of Darkness, which is definitely superior to um, In the Mouth of Madness, um, okay. it all takes place mostly in one building, in a, like a church, I think. Um, and like it's got a couple of different levels. There's a basement where like most of the weird stuff is actually happening. And there's yeah. uh, like different rooms because there's also like a dormitory built into the church, I guess. Yeah. Maybe it was like for seminary students or something. Uh, but most of the movie takes place in this one locality. Um, this one, it kind of goes to a few different places and i I felt like he had more budget but didn't know what to do with it yeah it also because this was like 94 yeah 94 94 okay yeah so that was when like cgi was starting to get a little big and he definitely used some cgi for like that page rip scene Mm -hmm. thing <laughs> but, um, that was that was some some digital blending for sure. Yeah, that was some digital, but which didn't look like horrible, horrible. Like it, I would say, it looked of the time. I yeah, guess, but, but of, what I of the time was also Jurassic Park, which coincidentally Sam Neill, oh, yeah. the lead of this one, was yeah. in the year before. So yeah, and that definitely was significantly better. It's interesting it. though that Sam Neill for like that hot minute felt like he was going to become like Hollywood's new leading man. Mm. And he he was definitely still working for quite a bit, but never really broke out and had a role quite as big. I think the last thing I remember seeing him in was in mm-hmm. um, Thor Ragnarok. He, um, he was in Thor Ragnarok? Yeah, you'll, you'll never guess who he was. Uh... It, mm, I'll never guess. So, you know, at the beginning... See the dog thing? (laughs) (laughs) No. You remember the beginning of the movie when Thor arrives at uh, Asgard and fake Odin, who's actually Loki, is watching a Uh play of himself? That Sam Neill? Sam Neill is playing the actor version of Odin. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. (gasps) Oh. Oh, yeah, it's really random. Rock again. Yeah, <laughs> that's hilarious. That's great. He is gonna be in the next Jurassic World, though. I heard they got him back on, and the paleontologist lady. I mean, might as well. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Even though they didn't end up together, and that was kind of heartbreaking. And when we saw them in Jurassic Park three, but whatever. I guess it was kind of heartbreaking. I don't know, because even though I was a romantic. I think as a kid, it took me a while to realize, oh, they're dating. Like, <laughs> when I, I mean, was first watching that's, Jurassic Park. That's, was- that's the implication in the movie, but in the book, it's actually a little bit more clear cut that she's really just like interning and went with him as an assistant. Like, it wasn't like, oh, there's like this romance between them. Yeah. I think that the- was for the movie. Yeah, the movie kind of sort of implies a romance, but it's not like they ever kiss on screen, I don't think, yeah. or anything. But yeah, I do remember in the book, she's, well, in the book is a lot more. Yeah, the book is so good. The, the book is great. Yeah. If you love Jurassic Park, go read the book. Knowing the movie will not ruin the book for you because the book is significantly different, but not yeah. so different that it's like bad. Plus, that whole chaos theory thing that Ian Malcolmson's character does. Yeah. Just so much better explained, yeah. So much better you know, explained in the book. Here's here's a completely <laughs> random tangent to all of this. But yes. you know in um the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, the first movie from eighty nine or ninety? I th- I I do remember it where you know, where they were like people inside the costumes. Yes. Um yes. only the first one's good. But anyway, when that came on D V D 
there were like some like fun facts for the Ninja Turtles that were thrown in as bonuses. So like each character was given like a bio and like, you know, their height, their weight, their favorite things or whatever. And a little mm-hmm. bit of a quote. And yeah. it said Raphael's favorite book is Jurassic Park. And there's a quote underneath it that says the book is way better than the movie. <laughs> I was like, the movie takes place in, like, 85, and they're talking about a movie from 93. I'm like, what? Like, th- that what? was that was an odd one, but okay. I, I accepted it because I agreed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go go read the books. It's, yeah. it's great. Um, wonderful tangent. Actually, kind of sort of my goal to not talk about this movie <laughs> for this movie. <laughs> I'm okay with that. The the movie didn't age well. It doesn't hold up. It's not as scary. I think it's a product of its time because Lovecraft horror wasn't as common back then. And this kind of introduced it quite a bit more to the mainstream. Yeah. And then it just didn't really resonate because cosmic horror is kind of hard to do. It's a lot more about... It doesn't come across as cosmic horror, though. Like, it doesn't hit it on the nail like it should. Like, I got a few of the Lovecraft stuff. Not too much, because, I mean, I, Cthulhu's and, not my favorite. Like, yeah. I like Lovecraft. I really need to watch Lovecraft Country, actually, on HBO. Um, but, it's bonkers. That show is nuts. <laughs> I know. I, I really need to watch it. But And I actually do have a collection of Lovecraft, <laughs> Did you ever which watch? I, I grabbed and pulled out. Did you ever watch I read True it, Blood? It's based off of it. Uh, I watched, like, I don't know, the first four seasons and went, I hate these people. And okay. <laughs> Well, so you know how like from season to season like something really drastic happened and it just kind of informed the whole rest of the show like my yeah. my particular favorite season was when a witch moved into town and she like entranced everybody to uh-huh. the point where like they were having orgies in the bars and stuff like, oh right like I'm that was going. yeah that was like really out of left field and it felt like every episode of Lovecraft Country was a different season of True Blood. It's that radical of a shift, like on an episode per episode basis. And they do everything. They do okay. Indiana Jones adventures. They do like Mummy Returns type stuff. They do <gasps> some really crazy sci fi. It does Ooh. everything. I'm excited. And there's a I'm lot of like racial though. commentary, which is like pretty on the nose too. <laughs> oh, we need a lot more of that. I yes. mean, we're getting a lot of that, you thankfully. Know, but that between, I want even more. Between that and Watchmen, I'm like, I was not expecting my pop culture to start like really talking about this stuff. But man, it, we, that, that was good. Change starts in media, hopefully. Yeah. We just got to get the other medias to like <laughs> freaking join in, you know, like the news and stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> and the mean, government. <laughs> baby steps, I guess. Baby steps. But, um, yeah. So in the mouth of madness. Cthulhu, (laughs) in the mouth of madness. So to me, okay, so the whole concept of this is that there's this, there's this guy and he's a disaster. Oh, he's an insurance investigator. That's what he is. He's an insurance investigator. And it starts with him in, in a psych ward, and that's your introduction to this character. And you're like, okay, clearly I'm about to learn why this guy lo- went insane. And you eventually find out that he has to investigate. No, he has to find the latest manuscript of this horror writer called Sutter Kane, which is quite clearly like Stephen King type. Yeah. Dean Koontz. Actually, probably more Stephen King than Dean Koontz. Um, horror writer who's like this crazy phenomenon. But for whatever reason, when people read his novels, they go freaking insane. In fact, his um, his publisher or agent, it was his agent, attacks the main character, Sam Neill's character, while he's eating in a diner with like an axe. Yeah. And his eyes look crazy, like goat eyes or something. Yeah. And eventually, um, Sam Neill's here. What is his name? Uh, John Trent. That's his character name. John Trent gets hired by the editor to 
by the publishing house. There you go. By the publishing publishing house to go find the manuscript. Played by Charlton he- Heston, by the way. This movie has some impressive cameos for like really small parts. Yes. Oh, seen. there was a Star Wars cameo in this movie. Did you notice? I think there was a familiar face, but like as we know from Geeks Watch, I'm really bad at faces and <laughs> and names. All right. So well, who? when when we get to that part, I'll bring it up. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'm gonna try to not go through like the whole movie. Cause I mean, hit the broad really strokes. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So he ends up going with this uh, with his editor linda styles a female representation in this movie it's just kind of freaking useless <laughs> <laughs> but hey it's a horror film i, I guess like, i mean what? at least there's a female in it unlike in the thing where there was, hey, there was at least, only a at least she's not computer. a at least she's not used for romantic subplots at, you know that's improvement but she is yeah. kind of I think it's I more mean, just like a like I'm scared and you're a man, but not like hey I like secretly in love with you. It's worse. That's <laughs> <laughs> not worse. inaccurate. Making out with a guy just to convince him to leave the creepy ass town you drove into. It's worse. <laughs> um. So he ends up. Through investigating, finding out that the, the covers of all of this guy's books lead to a mysterious town, and who even bothers to remember somewhere in the Northeast America. And he and Linda drive there, and there's a very creepy driving scene, which went on probably for five minutes too long to remain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because then you get bored of it. Yeah, you're like, oh, God. And then I just end up laughing when they hit the old lady on the bike. <laughs> like, <laughs> just like, oh, thank gosh, we're done. <laughs> like, I mean, something just, to it, break up the monotony. Uh, yes, something. And they get to a town called Hobbs End, which was really on the nose. And this was where <sighs> I'm like, is it Lovecraftian? Is it just demonic? Because Hob is another word for, like, demon or devil. Mm-hmm. So that's where I was thinking it was more devil based and then you kind of get the Lovecraftian like I didn't really like this is where it didn't nail the interdimensional Lovecraftian kind of sort of yeah Cthulhu creature of old because even when he says when stutters like or stutter whatever the author is you can like call him stutter that's fine stutter yeah he he says it'll be the the old gods coming in or something. To me, that still meant demons in my head. But I know demon lore a lot more than I know Lovecraftian lore. Yeah. Yeah, which is another thing. Like, Lovecraftian lore can be very similar to demonic lore anyway. I mean, from a certain point of view, they could be one and the same, yeah. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I only got it as Lovecraftian because quite recently for... The Love of Pages podcast I'm on, we listened to a version of Sherlock Holmes that was where the old Lovecraftian creatures took over England. Ooh. And like the queen was like Cthulhu ish. Wow. It's just, yeah. Really cool. You should give it a listen. It's that called sounds a school. Yeah. It's called A Study in Emerald and it's written and well, we did the audiobook. It's written and voiced by Neil Gaiman. Or Gaiman, however you're supposed to say it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and who wrote it? Neil Gaiman, the guy he who also wrote, wrote it? Stardust. Yeah, he also wrote it. Yes, he also wrote Stardust, American Gods, basically a bunch of awesome fantasy, sci-fi, horror, mm, young adult, Coraline. Yeah, I he's, like Gaiman. He's cool. Yeah, he's he's amazing. I think he did a run of the Eternals, if I'm not mistaken. And that's one of the reasons I'm really excited about that movie coming out. If they borrowed any of his uh, ideas from that run. He did? I'm going to have to read his run of the internals. I, I couldn't so. get into Sandman too much, but I might be able to get into 
Eternals. Yeah. I need to give Sandman another chance. I might have been. Uh, actually, if you follow me on Twitter at JM Bailey Writes, I posted a picture. I bought American Gods and Stardust. Yeah, those at classic my like retro covers. Because it's it's like a 1980s retro cover of them, and I'm like. I wanted to buy American Gods anyway, <laughs> and Stardust like, is uh, one of my favorite movies. So, and yeah, I've been really meaning to read the book for. So, it, it looks like those old Nancy Drew and Hardy Boy covers. Yes, oh, they're they're just beautiful. I'm looking at them right now. They're next yeah. to me. You can't see. <laughs> Sorry, listeners, but oh. But you can go, go to uh, Twitter and see. Uh, yeah. Go to Twitter. <laughs> go go to J M Bailey writes. Scroll down a few. I don't tweet too too much, so and you'll find a picture of them, and they're they're great. You could probably also just Google old looking cover of American Gods and find it too. But where's the fun in that? Why not you know, search a little? There's future? <laughs> there's a there's a couple of Instagram pages I follow that are basically like old pulp cover art, and mm-hmm. yeah, that kind of stuff's right up my alley. Another random tangent. I remember when <laughs> all the all the Kylo Ren and Ray shippers, the what do they call it, Raylo or something Raylo, like yeah. that. Yeah, um, they did a like old romance novel cover of like him holding her and her like in the damsel in distress pose, and he's that it's that shirtless version of him yeah. kind of thing. And the sad thing is, I worked in a used bookstore. Uh, when I was in high school and a little bit of college and I recognized the original cover they were pulling <laughs> it from and I was like it's this <laughs> which I can't remember the title of it right now but <laughs> I mean just, maybe. <laughs> just just look in that general section at the bookstore and like every yeah. other book will look like that <laughs> yeah I really wish they would bring back actual artists like not actual artists because digital art is art I shouldn't have said that but like just elaborate paintings instead of just like pictures or um, like covers and I just also as a writer myself I can't stand it when they put the character on the covers because then that's all I can see and quite often the character on the cover does not match the description of the character in the book and that drives me freaking insane <laughs> like, mm. yeah but I can talk about covers and books for days which would work because I don't want to talk about this movie, but no, we probably should talk about the movie. So speaking of books, so it turns out yeah. that uh, <laughs> the author was uh, creating a portal to another dimension. Yeah, he was somehow writing the truth. And well, if you read, is the book called Hobbs End? Was that what the book was called? Yes. The, bu- the the manuscript he's working on is called Hobbs and wasn't it and hor- if- horror at Innsmouth or something like that or I could be thinking of an know. actual Lovecraft story well how about this we'll just summarize the story so yeah. Sam Neill playing a character called John Trent goes mm-hmm. to investigate the disappearance of the author um, yeah. the author whose books that once people read them tend to go insane and go on a slightly murderous spree when they get there the town is not supposed to exist, and the lady editor that goes with him is like, hey, this was all supposed to be a stunt, but like, this is real now, and he doesn't believe it. He's like, super He's logical. Still like, he, it's still a stunt. It's a yeah. published, yeah, a publicity trick, which, wow, a very elaborate publicity trick, making up a freaking town. Yeah. around this, <laughs> yeah. And like, everybody in the town is not real, and we come to find out Neither is, I, I don't know about the woman for sure, but Sam Neill, it turns out to be also a character in the story. And they demonstrate yes. this yeah. kind of in a cool way because the, um, the female protagonist is reading, um, is essentially describing the scene, including mm-hmm. Sam Neill starting to get kind of scared and running away. She's reading yep. all of this from the, from the script. And that's the scene, probably like the biggest set piece of the movie, um, where you have just all these weird kind of distorted figures and bodies Uh just kind of like chasing him down this long, creepy tunnel. Yeah. And then I guess he... The the wall of people, too? I think so. Yeah. Like the pages of the book were like the fabric of reality ripping open at one point yeah Um, and yeah that's where you get the cheesy page rip 
to yeah. make the hole in the dimension thing yeah. and all it reminded me of it was like something from like a PBS library <laughs> show where the kids rip the page in the book or like rip the page on the screen and then they're inside the story like that's what it felt like to me <laughs> like this yeah. belongs on a kid's show like an educational kid's show yeah this, the, this, this is like the, I think that was the problem is that this horror is for like a more innocent time when like there was nothing else that was really that scary and this was like whoa like a book can make you go crazy whoa like oh man like what if we're not really real what if we're like the figment in a figment in someone else's imagination isn't that spooky you know and no like um, we're we've we've gone way beyond that by now so this like doesn't really fit and it doesn't convey the themes of cosmic horror which are mostly the mm-hmm. ideas of the realization that existence is kind of meaningless when yeah. there's these huge powerful interdimensional beings that without even thinking could like destroy us in a second and it's it's it's, it's, it's like that scene at the end of the first men in i think it's the first men in black where it zooms out the and first the and aliens, the second really yeah and the aliens are playing with marbles that have our galaxy in it like that yeah. is to me the best representation of like life is scary and also meaningless. Yeah. <laughs> the that, aliens that playing exactly marbles right. with our galaxy. <laughs> I like um, I saw on Instagram recently because I, I like a lot of like philosophy and nihilism pages. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a picture of like a scale model of the universe with like the different planets all lined up side by side, so you can see like how different they are in sizes. And then mm-hmm. the sun, which is you know obviously much bigger than all of them. And then yeah. another sun that's from, like, the nearest, like, constellation. I forget which one. Alpha Centauri or whichever one it is. And it's mm-hmm. just, like, this huge ball huge. of burning gas mm-hmm. that's, like, three times larger than our sun and so on. Yep. And then there's a little arrow pointing to the little blue dot that's supposed to represent Earth. And it says something like, um, your meaningless life is carried out right here or something like that. And I was like damn man <laughs> i'm just trying to enjoy my hamburger and i have to look at something like this and be like oh yeah well i mean just because you're a tiny teeny tiny tiny piece doesn't mean your life is meaningless though like i get the concept of that <laughs> but at the same time it's like no you you're still here for a reason like even if that reason is because two stars exploded long long time ago it's, it's so that we can podcast about in the mouth of madness but also not podcasts about it because <laughs> i'm letting every single tension uh, so as he's escaping from that tunnel of uh, monsters he i guess like wakes up and he's on the side of the road i i will note that was a good representation of what it's like like that before you wake up when you're dreaming and you're trying to run in your dream and you're going all slow like that's how i felt watching this scene it's just (laughs) like you just can't run because you're about to wake up and your body knows it's paralyzed right now so it's Mm. like is that why you feel that way Yes, when you're in um, REM sleep when you're dreaming your body is paralyzed because everything that's going on your dream your brain is indicating should you should be actually moving and so Mm it kind of shuts out and paralyzes the rest of your body so you don't actually do the movements um people who have issues with that are people that sleepwalk or move in their sleep that's because their body isn't paralyzed what it should be um there's also another thing where you can wake up and still be paralyzed which is really terrifying until your body recognizes oh i'm awake now yeah Yeah. but night uh, but yeah what's uh, they call it sleep paralysis something like that yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, th- I think that is what it's what it's called. But so, uh, so Sam Neil wakes up, or John Trent wakes up, and he's basically on like the side of the road, um, and there's a little boy on a bicycle that's just kind of passing by. It's like, hey, are you okay, Mister? Something like that. That's uh, like from um, what is that movie? Charles Dickens, the, the Christmas Carol. What like day a- is it? Like, like <laughs> is a child. So that brings us to our <laughs> Star Wars cameo. Do you know who the boy with the bicycle is? Oh, is that um, Anakin? Yeah. Is that Hayden Christensen? It is. I thought I saw his name in the credits and I was like, <laughs> what? Oh, so that was his, his first. I did see that in trivia. This was his first role. But I was like, oh, that's a little, little, 
little little Darth Vader. <laughs> yep, little little baby Annie was um, little had no idea Annie. he was going to killing younglings one day. <laughs> um, yeah, so then he goes back into town. He goes to the uh, publisher. The public. He's trying to warn the t- publisher that you know this is happening, and he's like, "What? What are you talking about? Like, I'm, I, you know, everything's fine." And he's like, "But you already the- gave me the manuscript." <laughs> yeah, and he says the girl's missing, and the uh, the publisher's like, "What girl? Like, there's there's never been any girl here," and he was like, "What?" And I guess he starts. Like, he follows somebody that was reading the book, and he just gives him, like, an axe to the face. Because I guess he wants to... Because it was always axes with this. If you were going to murder somebody because of this book, you had to do it with an axe. I guess so. I I guess maybe it's just because of the finality of it, you know? It's, It's very... Um, I, you know, it would it would be cool though if before he cleaved somebody with it, he he uh-huh. said something like, "I'd like to ask you a question," and then blam, just smash that, him with it. That would have made me love this movie. <laughs> if that really was the line he used, I, I would have been believe, sold. Deep down inside, I want to believe that's what happened internally <laughs> in this monologue. Um, yeah. So that ends up having uh, getting him committed because I mean, only a crazy person would do that. Um, and while he's, I guess, committed and he's going crazy in his cell because you see that he's written all kinds of stuff on the walls, all kinds of crucifixes, including on his face for some reason. Um, it sounds I'm like crazy. the world Might went as well insane. Be crazy. I guess so. Yeah. He's just going to commit to it. He's like, okay, I'm crazy now. Like, <laughs> this is a choice. And so he gets out. The, the asylum is empty. He goes into town. It mm-hmm. looks like an apocalypse happened. And he goes to a movie theater to watch, I guess, the movie of Himself. everything that we just yeah. watched. Yeah, he basically is watching his yeah. own life in the movie theater, which is, in a weird way, creepy. But because the movie itself isn't scary, it doesn't really do anything. No, it doesn't. Um, it was you know, a horrible ending, and, actually. I was like, okay. It was a non-ending. Laughing. Yeah, it was a non-ending yeah. because... The movie basically just ends right there. And it feels like there was a lot of buildup for no real payoff. Um, a movie that's much more effective than this in almost every way, mm-hmm. um, including the kind of a non-endings, very similar. Um, mm-hmm. Naked Lunch. Naked I Lunch. I think I've watched that one yet. Dude, you I would know. I think you if want me to watch it, though. I, don't, I think you've I don't, mentioned it before. I don't know if I want you to watch it. I kind of do, but <gasps> at the same me. time, it's like... So let me let me describe Naked Lunch a little bit. Um, imagine trying to write a film noir mm-hmm. about being an exterminator. Okay. But doing it while you're having like a crazy high fever and hallucinating like really strange things. A film noir exterminator, like bug exterminator or yes. rat exterminator? Okay. Like an insect exterminator. So Naked Lunch is a movie um, starring the dude that plays Robocop, um, Peter Weller, I believe. Um, okay. There's a few other people in it. Roy Scheider, the guy who played mm. the sheriff, or, or yeah, was it the sheriff? The guy in Jaws that ends up killing the shark. Ah, cool. Yeah, okay. love that guy. Yeah, Roy Scheider. Um... It's a movie where it takes place like in an alternate dimension where it's mm-hmm. kind of like the 1930s, I think. Okay. And one of the biggest... Is it prof- in black and white? No. Okay. Oh, my no. You might be thinking Eraserhead because that's kind of a famous black that's, and white movie yeah. with like weird bug looking things. No. Yeah. This movie is a fever dream of a movie. Ooh. Weird shit happens for no explicable reason. It has really impressive, um, like, puppets and mm-hmm. costumes. Mm-hmm. Um, have you ever seen the movie Brazil? No. Okay. I was going to say, it's kind of along those lines with the surre- surrealness of the cinematography. Um, mm-hmm. 
but just some really, really weird shit happens in that movie. That's okay. very hard to explain. Somebody's typing on a on a typewriter, and then uh-huh. the typewriter metamorphizes into like a in, giant inkset head. So like the keys Ooh. are still attached to the face, but they're moving the way a bug's mouth would move, and they talk Ooh. to the main character. Um, That's and fun. What has to be one of my favorite parts of that movie mm-hmm. is that. The main character, Peter Weller, is telling a story for no real reason. He just starts telling a story to some friends of his. He starts talking about a guy who, who, um, who could, <laughs> he could like fart so well, he started to make words come out of his ass. Because that's how much like flatulence control he had. Till eventually he could form words out of his ass. And, and I then, thought it was a talent to be able to burp the alphabet, man. Dang. Yeah, no, this this is this is a whole other level of like gastronomic uh, impulses, and <laughs> he is. So the story continues to like just like crescend into this idea that the, at some point the asshole can talk, and then besides talk, at some point it can actually make its own choices and say its own things independent of what the the person is is thinking till eventually the asshole overwrites the person and it reminded me of this story that i read in high school i think it was called the axolotl and if you know what an axolotl is it's like these little weird amphibians that look like pokemon um okay and oh okay yeah, and there's a story that I remember in high school where this kid goes into like an aquarium and he becomes transfixed with an axolotl and he's just staring okay. at it and staring and staring and th- the point of the story is that they s- they switch consciousness and before he realizes it he is now the axolotl and the axolotl <laughs> is apparently in his body and he gets up and just leaves. And so the the little so boy like, is like is contemplating great. life as an Bye. axolotl now. So it had some very like Kafka esque metamorphosis, you know, like undertones. And that's what yeah. that story reminded me of in Naked Lunch. But just the randomness and the weirdness of it, of like this really well thought out, really well told story. That if you think about it, I'm like, why am I giving this any attention? <laughs> but if you listen to it, it like entrances you with like the language that he's using because it's very descriptive it's very like it puts you in the moment Hmm. and that does so much more than anything in the mouth of madness does (laughs) as far as storytelling (laughs) or creep factor it's so weird uh yeah because like in the mouth of madness is very much you have like a bunch of different like short story horrors coming together like in which you had that the endless road dimensional thing that's clearly like a horror short story and the, and the, the, the lady small town that owned, commoners yeah. yeah the small town commoners the lady that owned the hotel that was actually keeping her husband naked and chained to her kind of thing like it was actually like you know the old lady sweet lady murderer kind of short story and yeah. then the random black spire church appearing everywhere which i think was one of the ones that was slightly this is where things are slightly based off of lovecraftian tales like those small things i think specifically it was the rats in the wall was referenced i can't remember exactly when but i just read that the rats in the walls walls were referenced and actually i was trying to read it while i was waiting for you but (laughs) didn't get that far but um like that was an interesting concept to me to have all these short stories in a horror town it was when it went to the whole concept of no sam neil or john trent is a character in this horror novel and the writer is writing the apocalypse like because he's being controlled by the i'm still gonna call them demons because it never really named them Um, but kind of thing that, like, kind of made it, like, oh, okay. And the whole concept of your life being controlled by a story is done significantly better 
in one of my favorite films called Stranger Than Fiction with Will Ferrell, mm. which is an utterly beautiful <laughs> movie about an author that, although that is more comedic and not horror, it's it's a better version of yeah, it. For sure. Yeah, and... I don't know. There was a few cool scenes, like the when the female character, what was her name, Lindsay, when she does her like crazy exorcist backbend thing. Oh yeah, that that was fun. Um, I read that that was done by a contortionist that was wearing a mask, and she couldn't even see. So the movement was um, all just her being led by John Carpenter, just telling her where to move or something by voice. Um, that looks pretty cool. Uh, the puppetry was kind of unimpressive, especially, like I mentioned before, especially after seeing The Thing, which had <laughs> such amazing puppetry in it that just so realistic looking creatures and explosions. And the, yeah, the, some of the old people makeup that they put on some of the characters didn't really look very convincing. Yeah, that or the aging of the kid that was on the bike or whatever. Yeah. She didn't look that great. It was very like wrinkled around the neck in a way that wasn't natural. So it looked yeah. like it was thick make well, not thick makeup, but the like that fake skin that they put on and put makeup yeah. over. Yeah. Looked like it was peeling actually. <laughs> um which that could be another thing that I think we've mentioned in other podcasts where if you're watching this and it's like in high definition was it when it wasn't filmed in high definition where I'll give them some leeway on that stuff because it's like this isn't how I was meant to see it kind of thing. They didn't think, yeah. oh, you're going to be able to see the wrinkles one day. Well, Whereas not only that, standard. Like, Carpenter yeah. isn't really one of those directors that really put a lot of stock in his cinematography. It was... Um, like I think he shot things very um, like economically I want to say but he wasn't but, very show-offy when it came to like his uh, composition of the shots if, if anything looks cool on camera mm -hmm. I think that was incidental <laughs> I don't think he uh, See, tried like to that, that like original old sci-fi horror director uh, oh what's his name he was famous for doing only one shots Horrible. He did um, Escape Plan from Planet Nine. Oh, oh Ed Wood. Ed Wood, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's Escape Plan from Planet Nine, but like, like uh, that, where he would only do one shot and be done. Plan, even that was when, Plan Nine from Outer Space. Plan Nine from Outer Space. Okay, that's what it was. Thank you. Um, which I have seen and is quite freaking hilarious. Have you ever seen Ed Wood, the movie? Yes, I have, which was why we went and actually we okay. went on a, yeah, me and my parents, we occasionally go on old sci-fi movie kicks in which we watch a bunch of old sci-fi movies. And we saw Ed Wood because my mom loves Johnny Depp. Okay. <laughs> acting wise, like she's not, she's not like, like it's her celebrity crush, but she mm. thinks Yes, he's crazy, but she thinks she likes how he really gets into a role, role kind of thing. She doesn't necessarily like first, him as a person, but that was the yeah. first really, really different role I remember him in. Because, mm -hmm. like, I think like his first movie was uh, A Nightmare on Elm Street, like part one or part two. I forget which one. Really. And he had a small part in it, yeah. And yeah. then um, he was a regular on Twenty One Jump Street, and he played you know mm -hmm. like a street smart cop undercover whatever Street person <laughs> yeah. and then i think i remember him in edward scissorhands yeah I think edward that came out first and that was uh, like a really like subdued performance because he was kind of like this shy introvert well, character when did benny and june come out because was that before or after edward scissorhands that was after was it, edward scissorhands was it because he's really good say. in benny and june yeah but. and then ed wood comes out and he plays like this off the wall character, like he's just insane. And yeah. I was like, oh, this Johnny Depp guy can actually act. <laughs> oh yeah, he can. Well, yeah. also, um, I mean, it's more recent, but Public Enemies, in which he plays like the gangster, and yeah, he's he's a huge method actor, which I think is what makes you like a little crazy. Yeah, he was so, he was great like, in Blow. Just, 
Yeah, but oh, he was in that uh, the 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 drug movie, something Vegas. Oh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. There we go. Yeah, yeah, that, that one. one. That one was insane. Actually, that's a good point. That was. Yeah, I I haven't seen all of that one. I've seen clips though, and I don't think it's the movie for me. But like, <laughs> that was pretty nuts. It's got some surreal imagery that was like, whoa, that's crazy. Yeah, they talk about also... Adrenochrome in that one. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> it's really weird that they just throw it in there. It was like, hey, have you ever done Adrenochrome? It's like the best stuff ever. Adrenochrome. And they just start yeah getting high off of that. Um. So yeah, so yeah, that in was the uh, in the mouth of madness plus a bunch of other stuff that was more interesting. Okay, so because I loved Elizabeth's random question, um, here's the random question for this movie: If you go to a bar and you say, "I want a cocktail called in the mouth of madness," what's in it? Whoa, <laughs> interesting. Okay, um, I'm gonna say it's gonna have to have some fireball. A fireball. A little bit of cinnamon spice, cinnamon yeah. whiskey, all right. With um, something that really clashes with that. So, like, maybe some, um, like, blue curacao. Oh, God. And okay. just for the hell of it, uh, I'm going to say one part uh, fireball, one part blue curacao. And one part, <laughs> Bailey's. Oh, God. I would say that is in the mouth of madness. Okay. <laughs> that would taste horrible. I bet it would. That I bet would you would so feel bad. insane for doing it. <laughs> oh, gosh. I actually... Oh, no, I don't have Fireball. Never mind. I'm safe. I was like, I actually could make it. No, I don't remember. <laughs> so I'm... I am going to go with... Um, which I'm probably not going to say right, because I don't think I ever say it right, but the absinthe. Nope, just because right. I feel like that's such a horror writer's drink, is absinthe. Because, I mean, any writer in general is like, I'm going to drink absinthe. Um, yeah, very absinthe. Uh, 19th century writers. <laughs> Yeah, or or just a really strong, clear liquor, basically. And just because I want it to be green, Midori, which is like a melon liqueur. Yeah. With like a dash of grenadine mm. to make that like red, bloody. And actually, no, maybe, yeah, maybe Bailey's too, or some kind of Irish cream liqueur to go in to make it look like milky blood in the well, green because green is very Cthulhu to me so very but Lovecraftian but I specifically threw in the blue curacao though because we have one scene in the movie where oh, John Trent's having line. a dream that he's uh, being spoken to by the author yeah. and he says have I ever told you my favorite color is blue and then he wakes up from that dream and everything looks blue everything looks blue which actually was kind of sort of cool that was a cool moment I was I like, say. oh yeah, there's even a lady with blue hair, which is like a meme at this point or a trope. <laughs> okay, yeah, maybe blue carousel instead of Midori then. But I but, still want like milky blood in it because of all the axe slashes. <laughs> and the, it's like brains mixed with blood. That's what I get from, you know, your head being chopped open with an axe. Just, I feel like it would look like there's a specific shot. That, I think it's called the skull or something like that, or it's Bailey's with I think grenadine on top, and it looks like a skull. There's I can't one, remember though. There's one it called the brain creepy. hemorrhage. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Maybe because it looks like a piece of brain with like blood coming out of it. Yeah, that's what I yeah. want it to look like. But I want it to be like tall. <laughs> like a shot. I just oh, it was like a milkshake. <laughs> Good night, because you're, you're gonna be so confused. You might you know, as well be asleep. <laughs> I want to. I want a milkshake now with like <laughs> all of these different things mixed in. I don't, because I'm lactose intolerant. But that sounds great. <laughs> I have. I have soy milkshakes. They do actually. Hey, almond milk would make life, a better milkshake. Than life soy. finds a way. Life finds a way. That's what happened to me. I was not lactose intolerant until I decided to quit milk for a diet. And then now it's like, you know what? Life decided it didn't need to find a way anymore. <laughs> so you're not going to yeah. have that way anymore. You're going to not why, be able why, to have lactose Why do anymore. we drink milk as adults? I mean, that's uh, 
not natural. It's not. It is something that we have evolved to do as people. Um, Until which you is stop why doing if it, you which... quit dairy, you can easily become lactose intolerant. So we just come um, acclimated to milk? Yeah. And it's something like other cultures are better with milk than others. But because of just how their ancestors would drink milk, I, I think it's more like Northern European ancestry are better with milk than other cultures as far as I understand. But Mm. I don't know. A lot of people say it's, you know, the dairy industry just pushes everything because it owns the government. So that's why you get those. You need to drink milk to get calcium ad when really you can get more calcium from vegetables. But, you know, in places like Mongolia (laughs) and Russia, like Siberia, all these different places where it's like super freezing all the time. Yeah. um, Farm dairy farmers can like milk their cows into like a circular disc. Uh Uh-huh. Like like a thick plate of milk. Yeah. Um, let it freeze and uh-huh. then just stack them like outside their homes like oh cool and store them like basically until th- they need them then they can that just take sanitary. a disc of milk and like warm it up to drink it <laughs> that's pretty neat actually it's yeah it was like man we we need more cool things like that in the world like uh, one more. milk disc please one milk disc please please or just be like what is it canada and england that has their milk in a bag and americans are totally like you know need milk in a bag <laughs> well when i remember when i was in middle school the year that i left to go to high school mm-hmm. that's when they phased out milk cartons and brought in the milk bags yeah and i was like what the hell is this and mm-hmm. it's like yeah it's like a capri sun but for milk and i was like dude that looks like a plastic bag like what the hell and I know that, like, in some poorer countries, like in Mexico, um, mm-hmm. I remember, I don't think it's a custom anymore, but it used to be that if you were, because they're really serious about recycling glass bottles over there, uh-huh. um, they'll sell you soda in a plastic bag. And then they just, like, tie it off and they put a straw in it, and that's how you drink soda. Uh, I think I've seen that before. Yeah, I was like, what? And the first time I did that, because, I mean, I was born and raised over here. So the first time going down somewhere deep in Mexico where they still did that, I'm like, mm-hmm. what in the hell is this shit? <laughs> Where's my <laughs> bottle? Like, what the hell? And I was like, oh, no, you don't buy a bottle. You just buy the drink and whatever. It was weird. This has got to be the least focused episode ever. <laughs> it is very intentional on my part. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hopefully the next one, <laughs> like, g- grasps our attention a bit more. I'm hoping so. Whatever the VHS Gems treasure box has for us. Yes. Um, so I guess I guess you would say, what do you consider a gem from this movie? Um, I like the general premise of it. The fact that it is attempting to do Lovecraftian horror in a time when it wasn't really that prevalent in mainstream media. There Mm -hmm. were some B-movies that had some elements of it, but usually those are always, you know, just restrained by budget. This one definitely had a decent budget. I mean, it had well-known celebrities in it. Um, David Warner's in it, um, the guy who plays um, Rose's dad in Titanic, and Mm -hmm. General Shark in Tron. Yeah, uh, he was uh, like one of the people at the psychiatry, like asylum place. Um, mm-hmm. John Glover, who has been in three different DC movies or DC projects, by the way, he played the Mad Scientist in Batman and Robin. Okay. No. Yeah, Batman and Robin, the one yeah. that uh, unintentionally creates uh, poison ivy. He was yeah. in Shazam as. The evil doctor's dad, Dr. What was his name? Sav- Savaro? Whatever his name is. He played his dad. And then okay. he also played Lex Luthor Sr. in. No, he played Li- Lionel Luthor in Smallville. He played Lex Luthor's dad. Okay. And I was like, cool. oh, that guy really likes working for Warner Brothers. <laughs> Contracts, probably. Yeah, I guess that's. Yeah, because he was also in. Um, in what was it gremlins 2 which is a warner brothers property mm. and uh that makes a lot of sense this movie was probably warner brothers then now that i think about it it's uh, uh it's got all of the telltale science of an early warner brothers movie i do not know new line cinema 
<laughs> oh, never mind then. Is who distributed it? Distributed it. <laughs> distributed it. Distributed it. was released in 1994 in Italy and came out in the United States in 95. February 95. What, in the mathematics? Yeah. Let I just read that on the, on the Wikipedia page. It's release date, December 10th, 1994, Italy. February 3rd, 1995, United States. So yeah, it premiered. I I'm assuming it premiered in Italy in 94 and didn't come out till two weeks before Valentine's Day in the United States. Because there always oh, should yeah. be a horror film around Valentine's yeah, Day. That, that's a good Valentine movie, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember Daredevil came out on Valentine's Day. And, like, that was... Like, I don't think that would have been a good date movie. It was, like, pretty bad. Hmm. Daredevil. The 2003? Yeah. Okay, yeah. With I Netflix. actually... Well, I guess, I guess it would have already came out before this comes out, but Journey into Mystery is doing Daredevil, and I am going to be the guest on it. I'm super Ooh. excited. For Daredevil? Yeah. For Daredevil, yes. I, I don't think I've watched Daredevil since 2003, so... Well, there was no Daredevil, too, unless you mean Elektra. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Elektra. Although it technically was supposed to be a spin-off sequel. Um, but he was in it, wasn't he? I don't know. But yeah, in like a de- <laughs> It was a deleted scene, I think. Like, I think he, like, telepathically oh, communicates okay. with her at one point. And that, that was the, the extent of it, really. Like a bat? Daredevil. Okay, yeah. The I Netflix guess the okay. Netflix version is much better. Uh, it, yeah, it is. <laughs> Did I ever finish it though? I don't even remember. Okay. Um I guess my jump from it would be the same thing. I guess I kind of do like the concept of a writer creating the apocalypse kind of. And the Lovecraftian element in it is something I don't know a ton about, so it was different, but to me it was just demons, and that's where I'm like, did it really hit the nail on the Lovecraftianness? Um, if I just thought it was demons till it got to like a certain line, and I was like, oh, that's like the people in a study in Emerald that I just listened to. Um, like, but I, I guess that was interesting. A few of the cuts, like that little, did I ever tell you I like the color blue and everything's blue? That was pretty cool. It was very hilarious to see that old lady on the bike get hit by a car. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was great. Um, the scene in which the Lindsay swallows the keys, I thought was fascinating. Which I read on trivia, the keys were made out of pasta, which is pretty, pretty mm. cool of a prop, so that she could actually, she actually is swallowing it, which is probably why it looked so neat. But it just very much reminded me of like watching toddlers and just <laughs> how they would be like no just eat it like no like, like <laughs> but, bad bad drop it yeah but i just it was to me in the long run just kind of boring not shocking in any way whatsoever i don't know if it would be shocking in 94 95 but yeah ultimately it was very it was very tame yeah, and, and it's didn't have tame. any any real shock value. That's a good way to put it. Um, yeah, whereas the thing that came out like years earlier was shocking. And yeah, it was horrifying. You know, you know what's funny is that John Carpenter also wrote and directed They Live, which has got to be one of the best movies of all time for just like the the male, the macho, gunslinging kind of character movies type really? movies yeah but it's got a great premise that one is about a guy um who's played by roddy roddy piper rowdy mm-hmm. roddy piper um it also has uh keith david who was in um the thing he played childs okay and okay. so both of them basically um you have you ever played duke nukem I played a demo of it. Okay, in the a long demo. Time ago. But yeah. In the demo, I think he says the line, "I'm here to kick ass and chew bubblegum and I'm all out of bubblegum." Yeah. That's taken from They Live. 
They live. Okay. Rowdy Roddy Piper plays a character who's basically just kind of like a drifter. He does like manual labor just to get by. And he comes across a pair of sunglasses once during like this crazy thing that happened. Like he found some sunglasses. I was like, oh, cool. Free sunglasses. Puts them on. And he starts seeing the world in black and white. Okay. And he's noticing that billboards and money and anything that has like print on it is actually mm-hmm. filled with subliminal messages. If you've ever seen the meme of like a picture of Andre the Giant and it says obey on the bottom of it. Okay. That's where yeah. this comes from. Really? So, yeah, like so he'll look up at a billboard and it'll say consume. He'll look at a magazine and it says obey. Um, hmm. money is your master, things like that. Like really like crushing propaganda basically. Yeah. And then he notices that some of the people, not all, but some of the people also look like these weird deformed alien looking things. Okay. Cool. And so that's the the whole point of the movie it, because it's very like conspiracy theory based that like aliens have kind of like infiltrated us and are controlling the population and they don't mm-hmm. want to kill us. They just want to keep us under control. So okay. like entertainment, um pornography, uh, mm-hmm. fast food, all of these different things are meant to keep us placated and to keep us not thinking while they yeah. basically like institute their control over the planet. It's cool. really interesting. It's, 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 right. uh, um, it, it's, it's both deep and also extremely shallow because it's also mm-hmm. a, like a, an action movie for sure. Like there's a lot of shootings that go on in the movie, a lot of hand on hand or hand to hand combat, uh, the fact that Roddy Roddy Piper was a professional wrestler is used extensively during the movie in <laughs> one of like cinema's longest fight scenes. I think it takes like 15 minutes. I th- something ridiculous like that. That's where cool. it, it might be more like seven, but like it, it feels like it it's feels a really, long, yeah. really long fight scene between cool. like these two characters that are just like pummeling each other like in this <laughs> dirty back alley somewhere. And... Um, yeah, still better than In the Mouth of Bandits. I remember liking this movie <laughs> a lot when it came out, and now it's like, you know, like, there's there's definitely been better by now, quite a mm. few. Hmm. By now and before. That, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. This and this was definitely like like his last. I wouldn't say it's a bad bad movie, but it's not his best, and this was definitely the last one that's relatively good because after that i mean you start getting um village of the damned which sucked which Uh. also coincidentally featured the last uh, movie role for christopher reeve aka superman superman yeah and it also had mark hamill in a small uh, cameo huh and so after that he did escape from la which is horrible that movie is a piece of shit uh, okay. Then he did John Carpenter's Vampires, which have uh, James Woods in it as a supposedly badass vampire hunter. It does not Ooh. portray. And <laughs> Ghost of Mars is just an awful, awful movie. Like it's it's nigh unwatchable. Ooh. And Tell me how was, you really feel. <laughs> I dislike it. <laughs> All right. Well, there's. Well, kind of, sort of, there is in the Mouth of Madness, because I think we, on this hour-long podcast, we talked about it for maybe 20 minutes. <laughs> you know, this movie was Which fool's gold. It's deserved. Fool's gold. Yes, it looked nice and lustrous at the time, but upon closer scrutiny and with the passage of time, it's mm-hmm. revealed its true consistency. It's basically just sulfur dioxide or whatever the hell it is. Whatever that stuff is, yeah. Um, so where can people find you to talk about Lovecraftian lore? You can reach me anytime, day or night, especially at night on Twitter. <laughs> I am at Magic Bollocks. All right. I thought you were going to say OnlyFans with a <laughs> at night comment. <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> and you can find me on Twitter as JM Bailey writes. You should totally try and go find those old neil gaiman covers um yep you can find this podcast archives of this podcast and others on our website geekily 
gmail.com. You can also find Geek Elite Media on Twitter and Instagram as at Geek Elite Media and Facebook.com forward slash Geek Elite Media. Geek Elite Media also has a Patreon page, which surprisingly is also patreon.com slash Geek Elite Media. Uh, <laughs> and so, yeah, it's it, totally awesome if you want to help help us out. If you have some p- spare coin, toss a coin to your Giggly Media <laughs> podcast providers. <laughs> Thank you for putting that back in my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's Spotify did it to me earlier. So <laughs> it's like, I love this song. Oh, Jessica. Can't wait. Um, if you want to hear John and I and other podcasts, we are also in Geeks Watch, in which we did watch The Witcher, in which that song, Toss a Coin to Your Witcher, is from. Um, we are currently watching Shadow and Bone and about to watch Loki. I'm so excited for Loki. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's it. Until next time, always remember to geek, geek out. out. This concludes our broadcast. Peace.